Hi, I'm Jay Hirsch, Director of Administration of Columbia's ERM program. I'd like to welcome you to today's event, CRO Spotlight Series with featured CRO Lakshmi Shyam Sundar. Throughout today's event, you may post any questions you have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Questions will be answered at the end of the event. I'd like to tell you about some of our upcoming events. On all Thursdays, we run our Exploring the Power of Mindfulness seminars. On Fridays, we have our Coding for ERM seminars. And on Saturdays, we run our IQRM seminars. On November 3rd, we have a new panel on operational risk and resilience. And you can register for all these events right now on the ERM website. And now I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Sim Siegel, founder and director of the ERM program and president of Symergy Consulting. Sim. Thank you, Jane. And welcome to all of you joining us today. We're proud to bring you today's event, which is another edition of our CRO Spotlight Series, which features one-on-one -on -one interviews with leading chief risk officers. I'll now introduce myself and our featured guests. I'm Sim Siegel. I'm founder and director of the ERM program here at Columbia University, the largest such program globally. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm also <clears throat> president of Symergy, a consulting firm I founded 11 years ago, focusing exclusively on ERM, serving corporate entities across a range of sectors, uh, including, excuse me, <clears throat> nonprofits and government agencies. I'm author of a, an ERM book called Corporate Value of Enterprise Risk Management, which I wrote uh, to help executives advance their ERM programs, but it's since also been adopted as required reading on syllabi of the Society of Actuaries, which <clears throat> Excuse me, is uh, the world's oldest risk profession and, and my chosen profession. And leading universities in the US, the UK, Australia, China, where it's been translated into Chinese, Italy, Croatia, and Egypt. And as I learned recently at a client, also Jamaica. And uh, since this publication 10 years ago has routinely been in the top 10 in the ERM category on Amazon. It is my honor to introduce our featured guest CRO, Lakshmi Shyam Sundar. Lakshmi Shyam Sundar is Vice President and World Bank Group Chief Risk Officer. She's responsible for overseeing financial and operational risks and is a member of World Bank Senior Management <coughs> Financial, Operational, and Enterprise Risk Committees, as well as the Pension Finance Committee. She's a member of the World Economic Forum CRO community and a speaker at various other forums. Prior to her current position from 2011 to 2014, Lakshmi was Chief Financial Officer and Director Finance Risk at the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, the political risk insurance and credit enhancement arm of the World Bank Group. As a member of the senior management team, she helped create the vision for and implement a new growth strategy. From 1994 until 2011, Lakshmi worked at the International Finance Corporation, IFC, also part of the World Bank Group, where she was director for corporate risk and director of IFC's risk management and financial policy department. She helped develop IFC's Client Risk Management Advisory Services and IFC's Portfolio Risk Metrics. She led the development of IFC's Integrated Capital Framework and was responsible for all financial risks and pricing in treasury, lending, and equity investment operations, as well as rating agency matters. She helped create and was co-chair of IFC's New Products Assessment Group, enabling sustainable IFC innovation in products and markets. Lakshmi is co-founder of the Global Emerging Markets Risk Database, a consortium for multilateral development banks, and international financial institutions. Lakshmi has consulted for a range of public and private sector institutions in the U.S. and emerging markets. She also has experience serving on the board and finance and risk committees of institutions in emerging markets. Before joining ISC, Lakshmi was a faculty member at the MIT Sloan School of Management, where she won an award for excellence in teaching, and earlier at the Tuck School of Business Administration at Dartmouth College. She has a PhD in finance from the MIT Sloan School of Management and an MBA from the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. Lakshmi, welcome to the CRO Spotlight. Thank you, Sam, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, really, thank you for inviting me to this. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, that's wonderful to have. You. I thought before we uh, dive into uh, some questions on your ERM program, can you first just give us a, an overview of the World Bank? 
Okay, that's that's a good place to start, Sim. I think, as you mentioned in your quite comprehensive overview of my background, the World Bank consists of many different organizations. And it's really four different financial institutions, if you like, two of which lend to sovereigns. That's the IBRD and the IDA. One lends to upper middle income countries, the other lends to the poorest countries in the world, and it's directly with sovereigns. The IFC, where I was, is more a private sector oriented institution, deals only with private sectors, no sovereign guarantees, and takes risk pretty much like any other commercial institution. And finally, we have a small outfit called MEGA, where I also worked as CFO, which deals with political risk guarantees. So if you put all these together, it's a very, very large organization, some over 600 billion in assets under management and very, very complex. We are uh, different from typical banks or financial institutions. We are owned by our member governments. And that's 189 countries who own us. We have uh, operations in 170 countries and offices in 130 locations with some 16,000 staff across the globe, about half in Washington, DC, and the rest all over the world. So I'd say the features that distinguishes us are, we're not just a financial institution, we're a developmental institution that tries to be financially sustainable. We borrow from financial markets and we want to keep ourselves triple A, which is quite a challenge when you think about the high risk investments that we are making and the environments in which we operate. And then, of course, we have people all over the world and we're not regulated. So uh, we are governed by international treaty. So there's no national regulator that imposes any rules on us. So it's entirely up to us to manage our risks in the right way and keep ourselves uh, relevant for our clients and provide them the financing they need. So let me start there with a brief introduction of who we are and how we're different. Uh, that, that's interesting. So, so no regulator, an advantage in a way there, but you've got to get 189 member countries to agree on, on what to do. Quite, quite, a, quite a challenge. So, a great, great overview. So, thank you. So, if you could take us back to the beginning of your ERM program, what was the initial uh, time when it was set up? What was the initial impetus that led to its development? Okay, so you know we're not regulated, so there's no regulatory requirement for us to really operate. We do have a AAA rating, as I said, and in a way, uh, you know, that forces us to be on our toes, be abreast of what's going on and voluntarily adopt best practices. So I'd say that was really the trigger. We're constantly improving, seeing how we can enhance how we operate. And we noticed, of course, that everybody was thinking about a more holistic way of looking at risk. And so around 2008 is when I'd say we formally launched something that was the precursor of today's enterprise risk. We called it at that time integrated risk management, and we were trying to pull together the various strands together. And it was around 2012 that a formal chief risk officer position was created. And there was I wasn't that person, somebody else had joined, and they were starting to create this. And I joined in 2014 as the new chief risk officer of the bank group. And we've made considerable headway, I think, in formalizing a lot of what was already starting to happen. And uh, most importantly, we started integrating many pieces of risk which were managed in a very fragmented, dispersed manner and created a real second line of defense. Now, we've been a AAA rated institution for a long time, so of course, risks were being managed. But I think the major thrust we gave, and this was really prescient, was creating a new operational risk department to deal with you know, the operational risks in the sense of processes, systems, people, all of the failures and in internal operations that could bring an institution down. And uh, given what happened after COVID and the transition to home-based work, the reliance on technology, I think this was one of the best things we did really in getting us formally launched into an ERM program, which enabled us to connect dots and see things. So that's how we are, but I wouldn't say it's a completed journey. It's really, we will have to keep evolving and adapt as the world changes. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, a good way to see uh, a lot about an enterprise risk management program is to see what decisions are, are supported or informed by it. But what, can you talk us through how you use it for decision-making? Okay. So I'd say it's very advanced and mature in the financial risk domain. 
So almost no decision will be made on how much exposure to take, how, who we should deal with, what financial risks we are running without the involvement of the CRO. That's very clear. Operational risk, as I said, was a journey. And we had to really uh, work our way through demonstrating added value. And now we are very much uh, really part of what drives most of the decisions that occur in operational risk. So for example, IT decisions, issues on data privacy, legal risks, vendor risk management, all of these, we are members. I am a member of the Enterprise Risk Committee. So all issues are brought there for decision making. And I think we're participating a great deal. At a higher level, I think given the, uh, you know, the constant flux we are in, we also participate very significantly in strategic decisions. So where should we be? Where should we not? How much, what does that mean for the risks we run? Can we take those risks? How much capital should that take? All of these we are very much. And just to give you a recent example, we had a, a capital increase relatively recently in 2018. And this was a major strategic rethink of where the priorities of the organization should be and how we would adapt to that. And we played a very central role in that discussion with our shareholders, the board and other constituencies, including clients and what they wanted. When you're involved in those, uh, those discussions, how, how is the involvement work? Is it you're at the table and just involved in discussions? Is it, are you more formally providing uh, different projections and scenarios and pictures of how the trajectory will change and volatility around it. How, how much in, integrated into strategic planning would you say? Uh, so I'd say on the financial side, very much, because no decision will be made. How do you size how much capital you need? You have to have all the projections, the stress tests, the scenarios, all of those sorts of things to make that type of decision. In terms of where we operate, for example, our board wanted us to operate much more in fragile and conflict affected states. Now that is a decision I'd say is more devolved to the operational risk units and we have a managing director for operations. So that type of operational strategy discussion would be led more by them, not by the CRO. But I think matters relating to the financial risks that we run, and the operational risks, we are very much in the driving seat. Perfect. And going through some of the process steps, the first major process step, of course, is, is risk identification, uh, specifically the main part of that qualitative risk assessment. Can you talk us through how, how you conduct that? So how it's actually done, how frequent is involved, and so forth? Okay, so this has evolved a great deal. Initially, when we started, we did not have a formal taxonomy of risks. And it was more going out to all of the leaders of the various parts of the organization, the region, the operational units, the support units, finance units, and talking to people and saying, what do you see as a risk? But simultaneously, we developed a very formal taxonomy of risks in four domains. One is strategic. The second is what we call development outcome risk, which is really what are the projects that we are doing? What do we seek to achieve for the client in those projects? And are we achieving those or not? And then the last two buckets are more familiar to a financial institution, which are the financial risks, credit, market, liquidity, and so on, and the operational risks that I alluded to earlier. And having developed this taxonomy, we have for each of these domains less so for strategic, but for the other three, a clearly articulated risk appetite statement, which is somewhat qualitative. But then we drill down and have subdomains. And many of the subdomains actually do have more quantitative metrics. Of course, much clearer in the financial area than in the other two, but we've made significant progress there. So now what we do is we have this taxonomy, so we think we know most of the risks that we face, but annually, we do check with all of the relevant heads of the various regions, departments, and it's more informal because there has been some fatigue with questionnaires and so on. So we just ask them an open ended question. What do you see as the emerging risks that perhaps we are not looking at or not paying as much attention to? And sometimes it's very useful just to give you one example, our uh, legal counsel. Uh, they saw some risks emerging 
uh, which they flagged for us. And I, you know, it relates more to, I said, we're an international treaty organization and we have certain immunities from lawsuits, but they saw certain pockets in which uh, that was being perhaps challenged. And they brought that to our attention. So it became a matter of senior management focus as well. And we put in some structure around how would we address this if it were to happen. And they were right in some case, the, soon after they brought this up, a case actually materialized, which fortunately we won. But you know, it highlighted that uh, you can't stop with a fixed taxonomy, things change. And you have to keep checking with everyone to make sure you have no blind spots. So we do that now through informal conversations. And I'd say we've created this culture now that people bring things to our attention. So we don't even have to reach out. They automatically come to us and say, look, we, we think this is an issue CRO needs to pay attention to. So that's extremely helpful for us. Thank you for that. You, you mentioned that you had uh, initially when you were developing your, your, uh, your taxonomy around risks, you, you, uh, you went out and talked to people. Uh, were those initial conversations in group settings or one-on-ones or confidential? How, how were they? How were so, they done? yes, it was a combination of uh, types of interactions. Uh, initially, very early in the process, it was group. So we would go to a certain vice presidency. They would select who would be the right people to talk to, and we would all sit together in a room and talk. Uh, now, that is very... Uh, intensive in terms of people's time. So as we matured and as we did this a couple of years, we realized it might be more efficient really to have a smaller engagement. And sometimes it would be me reaching out to my counterparts in various parts of the organization and just having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, which is very qualitative, very unstructured, but very useful in building a two-way exchange of information. I mentioned also we had these formal questionnaires that yeah. we used to send out and bring bring them back, tabulate them, interpret the results, and then go back and have a conversation with them, saying, have we interpreted this right? And the beauty of that exercise was, of course, you could then connect all the dots with the various others, you know, because somebody may have brought it up in one area, another person may have brought up something different, and you say, how do we reconcile these? Or maybe they're the same message we're getting, so we feed that back. But I'd say it's been a combination of all these. More recently, with all that's been going on this year, for example, we did not do a formal exercise. And you know, I'm in constant touch with everyone. Risks are constantly on our plate, and we're seeing everything emerge. Right. So, uh, and we have also things like our emergency management team and our crisis response platform, where we're constantly sitting together, pretty much on a weekly basis saying what's new, what's happening all over the world, what do we have to deal with? So we're not doing this formal exercise this year of going out and reaching out and saying, what are the risks you face? Yeah, naturally, yeah. So it, it's nice to mention the culture has, you changed the culture to the point where yes. people see you as, a, as an active partner, they're reaching in, you got that, instead of that push, you got you got that, that pull, people are, are giving to you. Yes. Uh, yes. Along the development, as you had those one-on-one -on -one conversations and you'll periodically re-perform -re those, are those anonymous one-on-one -on -one conversations or is it all open? They're open. They're open. Okay. Quite open, yes. And do you have do you do you have at any point a consensus meeting where you've aggregated, consolidated a list of all the risks and have a single uh, sort of consensus scoring and ranking? So yes, we, yeah. we used to do that. And right now we haven't been doing that because of the fatigue and the stretch on people. But yes, we used to do that. We would tabulate all the results, rank them, score them, and then share that with everyone. And initially, it used to be an actual physical meeting where we would share it. Uh, then it sort of evolved into just sending it because there wasn't that much new each time. So we said, OK, we'll just share the overall yeah, so results with you. But you do see the rankings change from year to year. Yeah, so you, you have that. So you feel that you have a good list of risks. You're monitoring them. And then you have on top of that people coming to you and of course now we're managing yes. through a crisis so yeah yes. okay that's and i think i, I understand how, how that works so thanks thanks for that yeah. uh can you describe the next step so what what's your approach to the the risk quantification of, of different risks that you have okay and you may have more uh, some areas than others but I'm yes of course how you, work uh, you know we've been in the finance business for a long long time and we've quite sophisticated, mature, I would say, in the financial area. So many of the tools that we use, the metrics that we have, 
are uh, equal to or better than what is used in many, many financial institutions. It's more challenging given the kinds of portfolios that we have, uh, the sovereign portfolio in particular, it's much harder. And we have something called preferred creditor status. So it's much harder to model things like defaults and so on, but we have done from some good models. So I'd say the finance area, market, credit, liquidity, and credit risk to our sovereign counterparties, as well as private sector, very mature, very quantitative. And we have all of the measures that not only tell you what's happening, but also feed into how much capital you need, both in the aggregate, but also in terms of subcategories in any way you would like to cut them, region, country, sector, whatever you like. And it also informs our decisions. So for example, let's say priorities change and you want to shift your business more to one area, we can actually put the price on how much extra capital does that take to do that. So this area, very, very advanced and mature. Now, when you get to the operational risk area, initially it was very qualitative because remember we were creating this department. We first had to you know, get the buy-in for it. So it was all very soft and gently. But then as people saw the value of this, they themselves worked with us to develop metrics. So for example, in IT, they developed a host of metrics on the performance of various systems, how many breakdowns do we have, how many outages, how many phishing attacks, how many uh, vulnerabilities to phishing attacks, software. I'm giving you the clearest example, but this happened in all of the areas of operational risk. So we've now developed, in addition to the risk appetite statements, key risk indicators and tolerance bands as well for those which are very, very helpful because uh, now it gives a more structured objective basis to say, yes, the risks are increasing in this area. We need to do something. In some cases, they've actually exceeded the threshold. And then that kicks off a discussion of, well, is our risk appetite consistent with our ability to manage this? Or do we need to do something? Maybe invest more resources to manage these risks within our thresholds or accept that there is a greater risk that you should accept that risk. And so it's really informing decisions. And I do think they're not quite as advanced as the financial risk metrics that we have, because you can't directly feed that into how much capital should you keep. But is it helping us monitor what's going on in all these domains? And is it helping us think about what we should react to, what we should be proactive about and make decisions? I think, yes, it's been very helpful in that regard. So even though, you know, it's nice to say qualitative, I do think quantitative metrics help. So, so I, if I understand how it works, you, for the, on the financial side, you've got some type of capital ca metric yes. or metrics as a dominant overarching that you can aggregate for the entire category of financial yes. risk. For operational, you have more, a host of metrics at the risk level. They may vary from risk to risk quite a bit. So you don't have common metrics you can aggregate operational risk exposure, but you feel it helps you monitor and make decisions on the operational risk side. I'd say that that's correct. Assessment? Yes, that's a very fair assessment. Now we do allocate some capital for operational risk. And the way we do this is really use the Basel formulas. So I would say it's not quite as sophisticated as what we do on the financial side. But what we are doing now, given that we've started, we've been tracking all these key risk indicators for a while, is we are building a database of actual events that occurred and also what were the losses, if any, that we incurred. And we're also tracking what we're calling near misses, things that maybe didn't become a serious issue, but could have. And I think this is going to help inform also how much capital we would need to keep for operational risk or refine our estimates of how much we need there. And a good, good current example is really Afghanistan. You know, where we had to evacuate 320 people. And, uh, you know, we're, we've been in fragile conflict affected states. We do have evacuation protocols in place. And those are typically with the United Nations. Now, this was a situation in which things were just unraveling in a way that, you know, the traditional ways of working with your partners were no longer adequate. And we had to get our people out and get them out fast. 
And luckily, we were able to work with some partners to get get them out right in time. Wonderful. But we do think, well, this was a real near miss. And it's causing us to now think about what could have happened. What does that mean for all of our operational risk uh, metrics and thresholds that we have? So we we care a lot about our people and our tolerance for loss of life is zero. But yeah, that, you know, was that was that realistic in Afghanistan? I don't know. We're very lucky, but you know, it's it's. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's wonderful. You're able to get them out. I, you know, it's it's something. It, it, it's very special to enterprise risk management that you know when look, when bad things happen, it's terrible. And there's also always something good that comes out for the future: better safety, better protection, better learnings. And uh, there's so many stories of things that seem terrible when they happen, and later we see. Wow, if that had not happened, it would not have better prepared us for preventing a much bigger uh, incident yes. later. So, uh, yeah, um, terrific. Okay, so let me let me move on to ask you because you you mentioned this a, a little bit already. You were alluding to to risk appetite. So, how do you define risk appetite? Is it defined qualitatively in some areas? Is it defined quantitatively in other areas? Uh, how do you use it in the risk governance process? Okay, so again, this is a mix of measures. First, at the broad uh, organizational level, enterprise level, if you like, we have a risk appetite statement that essentially says we will pursue our developmental objectives and satisfy our shareholders and clients while remaining financially sustainable at AAA levels. So that's a given, and that drives then everything. It cascades through all the other risk appetite statements that we have. Now, in the financial area, as I mentioned earlier, it's all very, uh, very granular, and we have very explicit capital-based limits on market risk, uh, on uh, liquidity, on uh, credit risk, and so on. As I said, we can calculate everything very precisely, and it drives all of the limits that we have for those operations. When it comes to the operational risk side, um, the appetites themselves at the high level are qualitative. But then when we get down to the subdomains, we are uh, articulating what we call risk tolerances, which give you some bands for the various metrics that we have put in place. And that's essentially an articulation of how much risk are we willing to actually accept in these areas and how much deviation, because you'll never hit it exactly on. But if it exceeds that band of deviation, then that's a trigger for rethinking what we're doing and uh, you know, either additional mitigation measures or uh, something else. But can, can you just give it a high level, your philosophy about when, if, and how your risk appetite will shift and how you handle that uh, you know, governance-wise, how you decide and approve? Okay, so uh, this happens frequently in the financial area. So we may we may have said, for example, not more than X amount of capital for such and such risk, but then the business changes and you do have to allocate more. So we have a very proper governance process for that. The request must first come from the business unit and they have to provide a justification for why. It has to obviously fit with our strategy and so on. Then we in risk, and it will depend on what exactly the request is, markets, counterparty, uh, credit risk will come in and they will assess what this is, what the implications are. And then they will see if there is room to reallocate from some other area where we're not perhaps fully utilizing the capital that has been allocated. Can that be done now and can we shift here? Alternatively, in very, uh, you know, after a period of expansive growth or excessive risk taking, you might reach a situation where you feel you don't have enough capital to take this new risk. And then that's what would trigger things like a capital increase discussion. And this is exactly what happened in around 2016. You know, we, were, we had stretched, we had stepped up as required by our shareholders, and our capital was getting very, very close to our minimum thresholds. And that's what triggered the whole discussion with all of our shareholders, as you said, you know, 189. Uh, now, I should say we don't negotiate with 189. They delegate to a board, which is 25 executive directors, each of whom represents a bunch of nations. And most of our uh, discussions happen with this board, which is a resident board. <laughs> so they're, they're literally physically here in Washington and we deal with them. 
on an almost daily basis. I'm curious, do you have members of countries going in and out uh, often, or is that more no, rare? No, that's very stable. We've had one or two instances of uh, one country withdrawing and so on. Uh, but no, it's, it's a very stable. I think everybody sees the benefit of belonging to this uh, system. So, uh, You already mentioned, I wanted to ask you if you could share some of the successes of your program. I, it sounds like, uh, you know, the evolution of your, uh, your, your categorization and how now people are, are you know, giving proactively, uh, giving you, you mentioned the legal issue that was raised in, in Afghanistan. Are there any other successes you'd like to share? Oh, yeah, I, I think the first thing I'd say is it's created uh, an awareness of risk. You know, in the past, I think um, people felt, well, you know, we're owned by all these governments, what can go wrong? <laughs> and there was that kind of attitude. And now I think they've realized this is a bank and we're raising money in capital markets, billions of dollars every year, and we do have a responsibility to manage our affairs in a proper manner. And I think it has created also a more structured way of thinking about these problems. So it's not as if people were irresponsible before, but they didn't have a common language in which to communicate. And we have brought that structure that enables people now to organize their thinking, put it into the format or framework that we have developed and communicate with us. So it has uh, helped a lot in that. It also helps in terms of standardization so that you can aggregate some things. It also, I think very importantly, helps us connect dots. Because if you leave everything at a very subjective, qualitative level without all this structure, it's very hard to see all the connections. And I think that's one of the biggest value added uh, that we have brought to this whole exercise. I mentioned before we started, risks were distributed and will be managed in a very dispersed manner. We now have something uh, more at a working level at the Operational Risk Committee, where people from all units come in and we discuss issues. And for example, HR might say they are changing a policy. But in the past, they would never think about what the consequences would be if you changed all the systems and how it would cascade down to the accounting and processing units. And we've had cases where you know, we've had downstream consequences as a result. Now everybody brings it, thinks about all of these issues up front and comes up with a coherent plan that is not just the policy change, but exactly how will this be implemented? What are all the downstream consequences? Can we address all those? And I think people really appreciate it. The other area where I think a high degree of comfort has arisen is when incidents occur, people now have a forum where they can bring the incident and say such and such incident occurred. Here's the root cause of why it happened and let's work together to fix it. And in the past, I think people didn't have an avenue, you know, they would fumble on their own and try to, you know, individually contact people to try and get things sorted. It's now much more structured and also an atmosphere of trust, which I think is very, very important. This is a very safe space for people to come and you know, no one department uh, has problems. Everybody has problems. So, you know, this is not something that you're not doing your job well. Things will happen and uh, you just need to be able to feel safe to raise those issues and work with everybody to solve them. So I'd say there's been huge, uh, huge benefits in that uh, that regard. I, I, I like how you described that. I, I think it was very well said. You touched on a couple of things I want to reflect back on. The, the, you know, and also the smile on your face, I could tell where you have the parts that you really, really love uh, that you've advanced. And it has the hallmarks of a good era <laughs> program from my year because you know, I, I talk about this a lot and, and, you know, my clients say this too, that, that it's not just what you set up, it's, it's, the, it's the language and the connection, giving people a pathways of speaking about something in the same way about the business and the risk that they haven't had before. People have looked at it this way, that way. And, and those conversations and connections, you change the culture. And that's clear that you have by your yeah. comments and your expression. And also the, uh, that you're, I like your phrasing about connecting the dots is that you, what you've done with your year-end program is you've identified the risk, you've got these levers and you have a framework of understanding their interconnectedness so that people understand you can't just pull this out. You have to be in the conversation, understand, so you don't have, you're more likely to get ahead of unintended consequences. Yes. yes. And that's a huge aspect of when ERM has yes. done 
right and holistically it's it's so that's exciting to hear you say that so. it is it is an it's been a very exciting journey you know i'm a finance person by background but uh, i created this operational risk department in 2014 and i'd say that's where we've made the biggest advances to be very honest it's it's really changed the culture around completely and brought exactly as you're saying a much more standardized way of talking about issues which was lacking and it's very hard if everything's amorphous and you don't have people you can connect to right here we know everyone's a champion of risk in their respective departments so they have an incentive to really cooperate and work with each other so yes and, i i feel very fulfilled about that yes and that's kind of a subtle thing that happens along the way is that people don't realize when you're initially over the years collecting information while you're collecting the questions that you ask the way you ask them the way they see you use it and feedback to them uh, like you said when people describe it differently you come back there you're pushing learning you're yes. you're advancing the culture you're training people while you're getting information at the same time suddenly one person at a time and then eventually you have enough people speaking and understanding and thinking in a, in, a, in an approach not not lockstep but having an approach to think together about and discuss it in the same way. So yeah, you, you, know, you, you mentioned training. I think that's very important. That's another thing that we have done a lot of, both internally in terms of all the risk champions that we have across the organization, but also bringing speakers from the outside, uh, sometimes on specific topics, sometimes more generally. For example, now during COVID, you know, we've really looked outside to say what what are people doing, how are they coping with this, and we bring all these people together, and I think that also creates a sense of excitement for people who are involved in this. So I think the training is extremely important. Yeah. Matt, you mentioned that you're you're not done. You're you're still evolving. What are some of the remaining challenges ahead? So you know, in the short term, one of the things, and this may seem like an odd thing to say, but it, I'm afraid of complacency because we have traveled far, everybody feels we've really done a great job. And with COVID, some people say, well, this was the worst crisis you could imagine. And we functioned so well, we actually responded to our clients, the maximum we've ever done in a crisis, all from home-based work. Every operation has gone according to plan. We did the most complex things. We worked to get vaccines to so many countries. Um, we've kept all our operations going, all our financial transactions processed without a hitch. I should mention we have a lot of our uh, shared services operations in Chennai. And Chennai was very badly hit by COVID. And there was real concern about whether we could do the financial closing correctly and on time, because people were being impacted. And yet we managed to do that. So I'm worried that people will say, well, can't we slack off a little now? We We've clearly showed we've managed risks very well. So keeping the momentum going and being prepared for the future, I think uh, that's that's a challenge I'm certainly having. Uh, I think in terms of looking to the future, um, the world has changed in very dramatic ways and it's changing very, very fast. The speed and the complexity of what we will face going forward is far, far different from what we've faced in the past. And I do think we need to strike the right balance between you know, these formal structures that we have, which are very often driven from headquarters and then work with everybody, to agility and flexibility at the operational end. I mentioned we have offices all over the world. Things are happening that we can't necessarily always uh, manage from headquarters. So we have to devolve uh, authority, power, responsibility to people in the field. And how do we manage this right balance of agility and structure? I think that's that's going to be very important. Um, I'd say also, you know, cyber security. I think that is a big challenge for us. It's a challenge everybody faces, but it's one again where you're always maybe just barely one step ahead of something happening. And uh, I personally feel in ERM, we may need to strengthen some of our uh, skills in this area. It's, it's hard to keep up. And uh, I, I do think that's one area. The second is, of course, climate change. This is a very, very hot topic. And uh, we are clearly focused on it on our client interventions. But have we focused enough on it in terms of our operations? We have in the sense of all the good things to do you know, in terms of energy efficient buildings, recycling, all that. 
but are we cognizant of the risks that we may face as a result of climate change? And uh, both from point of view of our lending operations in client countries, but also our physical operations. And do we have you know, the adequate mitigations in place? I, I don't know. So it's something we have to pay much more attention to. We've always had things like earthquakes, floods, and so on, but they're you know, localized events which we've been able to deal with. Now, what if there were a regional catastrophe of some kind? And uh, my sense is that is coming sooner than all of us may have thought. You know, everybody thought maybe it's 2030, 2050. No, it, it may happen much, much sooner. So are we prepared for that or not? Is I, I think something I'm worried about. Yeah, uh, you know, it's funny. I was just this morning was reading a little blurb about uh, these cleaners that, you know, suck in the air and clean out, clean out the carbon. They're talking about it's a part of the solution. It's a, a limited in scale now. But I, I always think, you know, there's the beginning of something, right? And then it evolves. Somebody finds something a thousand times more efficient, but the same type of thing. I've always envisioned from the beginning that it's so hard to get people to stop burning coal. It's, it, it's probably just going to end up where you just have to figure out how to clean the air. And, it, you know, it's starting. I just wonder. So, we, you know, we, we're going to see it. There's a lot of things we can't see ahead as to the, as the negative consequences. And there also may be some surprises in some efficient mitigation we haven't invented yet, yes, uh, engineering-wise. Yes. So yes. Let's, let's all hope for that. Uh, when I can I ask you, uh, turning a little bit to, uh, to our students, what advice do you have for our students and graduates that are entering the ERM and risk management fields? Okay, that's an interesting question, because if I look back on my career, when I started, there wasn't actually a title called the chief risk officer. There wasn't even a formal field of risk management. People were managing risks, but there wasn't a formal field. And I sort of stumbled into it by, you know, I happened to join uh, IFC at a time when they were facing some significant risks. And I happened to add value there. And I was seen as, you know, oh, this is good. Why don't you do more of it? And it did evolve like that. And I caught the wave and rode it. And, you know, here I am. But I think uh, there is a lesson there is that you cannot really plan your career. You have to go with the flow and you have to see what are the hot issues now where with the skills I have, I can add some value and then build from that. That's how you get the momentum. People start to appreciate you and your career grows. So I would say rather than look at a formal you know, career path, uh, that's there and that is something that will happen naturally, but focus on where where you can bring value and solve something that your organization is facing today. That will you know bring people to value you. The other I would say is to be um, you know constantly hone your human capital. All of us go to school, we learn certain things, but uh, as I said earlier, the world is changing and learning never stops. And you have to constantly keep abreast of what's going on, both in your own subject domain, but also you need to be able to link things across. I said the um, CRO function is largely one of connecting the dots and you have to be able to think broadly. So it's a combination of domain expertise and generalized thinking, and you need to cultivate that early in your career. I've seen some people who work with me, for example, who are experts in one domain. But they have not somewhere, not because they couldn't, but they didn't do it, develop this more generalized thinking. And then you find your career stalled a little bit, because as you get higher, that is more important. The other thing I would say is, um, in addition to strong technical skills in whatever your domain is, you do need to have extraordinarily good interpersonal skills. Uh, I mentioned, you know, we had to get buy in. There was a lot of persuasion, talking to people, winning their trust. So I'd say interpersonal relations is a huge, hugely important thing to have. And also communication skills. And I mean 360 type of communication skills, communicating with junior people, communicating with your peers. Some, some of those might be very technical conversations, but then communicating higher up where it's not technical very often. It's really a selling job, a persuasion job, a negotiation type of job, but you have to be able to communicate complex things in a way that they could understand. So it's really a host of skills that you need to, to do well in this area. The final thing I'd say is 
try and also spend some of your time in the actual business side of things, the operations, because you get a much better appreciation of the complexity. You also uh, begin to start thinking from their perspective. And that makes you a much better risk manager because you can see things from the other person's side. And you know, some of the critique about CROs or people in the risk function is they just keep saying no. And that's not very helpful. You have to be able to say yes and construct solutions, but equally you have to have the integrity and the stomach to say no if it's really no. Uh, and that, that's very important, especially as you get higher, uh, higher up, uh, the ability to speak to someone even higher than you and say, I'm sorry, we, we really cannot do this. Uh, so you do have to develop that stomach as well at the right time. Thank you. I've been taking notes to track all this because uh, there's a number of things you said uh, I want to follow up on. One, it's, it's, it's so true. I think so many of us don't appreciate the uh, aspect of luck in, in what happens to us. And you also made a point is you have to be prepared for that luck. You have to have the broader view and the flexibility to say, well, I'm on this track, but wait a second, I can apply my skills here in a better way. There's an opportunity and to do that. So, so having that broad view, and I think that's a good message for our students and graduates, you have a tremendous toolkit. Keep an eye out for where you can best apply it. And a lot of businesses start out that way. Uh, you know, entrepreneurs, they start out with one idea and yeah. they sink if they just narrowly think about it. But if they happen to trip along, oh my gosh, I thought this was my business. This I thought would be 5% turns out to be 10 times the revenue. You go with it. So you got to seize, recognize, think about, recognize those opportunities. Uh, you mentioned uh, constant learning. We Luckily, we sit within our, our program, sits within in Columbia in the School of Professional Studies, which is a lifelong learning thing. And I'll just uh, you know mention that we, we have, so we have the master's degree, we have certificate. We are planning in the future, we can't announce it yet, we're planning on building other uh, certificates that people can get as an add-on after their master's to get uh, a little different deeper dives in certain areas. So that's something our school is well aligned for and our program is constantly evolving with that. Uh, I really like that you mentioned the interpersonal skills and communication skills. We think this is this is something we emphasize a lot in our program. Uh, we have uh, core courses, we have uh, elective courses focused on giving people the business communication skills because every CRO is successful, like you says that, at, at least half the job is interacting with people you you can have the best idea it doesn't matter you still have to persuade people and comment them from where they are and, and you mentioned being on the business side understanding how people think from the approach that they have what are their goals what are their concerns how do they speak about the business learning that language and building a bridge from where people are to where you are and getting them to say very very important so uh thank you for all that i'm going to ask uh given the time i'm going to ask uh at all those if you have any uh, questions please type it in the and the q a and we will We'll present those questions to Lakshmi uh, as, as you uh, enter them. So please do that now. Uh, I have uh, one question. Uh, and I think you, you answered this a little bit. What ERM lessons were learned through the pandemic? So the pandemic, as I, I did mention, uh, you know, people said we did very well. And the reason for that is we were prepared. So we had given in the operational risk area a lot of importance to business continuity and resilience. And we had been fanning out throughout the world, uh, I think starting in around 2015, going and doing drills of various scenarios that could occur. And how would you cope? Who would be responsible for what? How would you deal with the situation? And we made repeated visits like this with various kinds of scenarios. And I think uh, likewise on the technology failures, we had, you know, redundancies built in, preparedness for things. So I'd say one lesson we learned from this was that being prepared was half the battle or maybe 90% of the battle. It did not require us to uh, do anything. And this is probably true of many organizations. Uh, they seem to have been more prepared than we thought. That said, I think it's also woken us to the fact that uh, how dependent we are on technology. I mean, all of this has worked for all of us and we were able to seamlessly shift to home-based work because of technology. But risks are not mutually exclusive. And you could have another pandemic and you could have a technology breakdown. Maybe it's a climate-related event that throws power out. 
what would you do in that scenario? So that is something we're thinking about now, the interaction of risks and that you can't you know, just see them one thing at a time. So we're now changing some of the scenarios that we're working on, on combination of events occurring and how would you deal with those? And in this case, for example, we, we've done it in Chennai and we say, well, we have failover transitions of those systems to another location somewhere. So we're thinking much more about multiple risks at the same time, and that's been one lesson. The other, as I'd say, is the need for agility and flexibility. Now, you know, ERM sounds very structured, and but we don't want it to get so structured that it gets bureaucratic. And people sometimes have to make quick decisions on the field. So how do we, uh, you know, manage that? In this case, we did it very well. We have what's called an emergency management team which as it was originally designed was very Washington centric because you know this is our headquarters this is where we operate but once this happened I think we were very quick in switching that to saying it's not just at HQ it's for everybody and how do you deal with the crisis as it evolves everywhere the pandemic as it evolves but now we're thinking more about making this a global crisis platform so that we can think about the whole world but balance it again with uh, field versus headquarters and situations might be very different in the different parts of the world that we face. So I'd say that's the other big learning. Uh, I'd say those are the two big things we're taking away from this. So multiple I, I'm, risks at the same time, being prepared, yeah. do the drills and uh, think about how things may differ in different parts of the world. Yeah, in terms of in terms of being prepared, there, you're reminding me of I have a, a you know, client. A lot of my clients are insurance because I come from the insurance sector. So, so he called me up. Uh, I guess it's like a month or so into the pandemic. We were talking, and he said, you know, because the, the, the of course insurance companies run through pandemic scenarios, and and it's on the order of magnitude of. Uh, we actually had a previous uh, presentation here. It's up on our website of walking through this. Uh, the, these the different clients and, and what they what they thought and blending those assumptions they're pretty pretty close and he said you know the planning we did and how the impacts to our business he says it's horrible but uh it's pretty much on par there's some differences but pretty much on par and they so they were really prepared uh so, so thinking through scenarios ahead of time of course is preparation i'm glad you also mentioned combination punches because that is something that a lot of organizations say, you know, we're so we're so unique, we're so strong. Come on, bring it. You know, there's no one, <laughs> there's no one big risk that can really hurt us that bad. And they may be right. And it's often combination punches that can do the most damage. One sort of rocks you back a little bit, the other one can really uh, knock you for a loop. So it's just with people. The same thing with us. If we have two events, one bang, bang, right on top of each other, uh, you know, it can make people spiral down more than the individual impact of them alone. So that's something to to watch out for. How do you prioritize emerging risk and allocate the resources to effectively prepare? Okay, so it will depend a little bit on what the nature of the emerging risk is. And if we think it's one that could be of very high consequence for us, I think we will somehow marshal the resources needed. We are budget constrained and we can't get new resources easily but we may shift resources from one area to another until we have addressed that issue, which does mean some of the other area might get less importance, but typically we would take people from areas which are relatively mature and which could function with maybe a more junior person taking charge and so on. But I, I think it will be very case by case in terms of how we address this. And uh, I mentioned one case which our legal brought up and there we saw that as extremely important. So we did indeed focus and uh, senior people were focused on that issue as a high priority. Okay. Uh, we have another question here. What is your view on key risk to observe globally across different geographical regions at present in this pandemic situation? How about sovereign risk with debt increasing globally? Yes, so this was actually a concern for us given who we are even before the crisis, before the pandemic hit. We had been raising concerns about debt levels, especially in the low income countries, more than half are at risk of uh, financial distress. Uh, and this is something we had been flagging before. Uh, it's been a major preoccupation for us in terms of all the work that we are doing. You may have heard of the debt service suspension initiative where the World Bank and the IMF uh, 
you know, led an initiative to have uh, some of the debt that was coming due from some of these countries suspended for a little while and it was extended until December 22. And we stepped up and lent even more to these countries to help them solve some of their problems. So we get paid, but the reason we get paid is because we actually end up lending more to those countries and the flows are net positive to help them deal with the crisis. And the problems are not over. We've clearly had some major restructurings already last year. And there are some countries that have applied for what is called a, a debt restructuring under the common framework under the Paris Club, which we're working on. But there are many, many challenges because the landscape has changed a lot. We've moved from an era in which the main lenders to these countries were the multilateral development banks and uh, governments to where there are many new players who are not members of the old Paris Club and so on. So bringing them into the fold, bringing private sector creditors into the fold, and how do we all renegotiate the debt so that uh, the country is put back on a sustainable path? I think that uh, is, is a big risk that we are facing, yes. And there are more countries now in, in getting into um, distress situations. Uh, given the time, I think we have time for just one last question. So I'm, I'd like to ask you uh, um, a question uh, for me. So what do you find the most rewarding in your role, CRO? Oh, I've, I've, uh, I think I've considered myself very blessed really to have been on this journey right from the start. Uh, I think first it allowed me to blossom and uh, demonstrate and use my skills in a socially meaningful way because of who this institution is. But also I think being in this area, one of the big advantages is how you are able to see all aspects of the organization. And that's very rare. In most functions in institutions like this, you get very specialized and you do one thing and you do it very, very well, but you have no clue what's going on in the rest of the organization. And given where I am, and for most of us who are in the risk functions, we talked about connecting the dots. We are one of the few functions, I think, where we see everything happening in the organization. For me, when you get to senior levels, of course, it's the participation in some of the most important decisions that are taking place, whether it's dealing with COVID or the pandemic or sovereign debt issues. I mean, it's really very, very exciting. So. Uh, I've been in a very happy situation for me personally, which I see your question. I loved finance and I was able to use that, but I was able to broaden much beyond finance and coming, I was born in, you know, I grew up in India at least. And so I have a perspective from development and developing countries. So this allowed me to combine my interest and background there with my expertise in finance and broaden into general risk management. It's been a fascinating journey for me. I've, I've been very lucky, loved every minute of it. It's been tough. I won't underplay the uh, difficulties because as I said, you have to sometimes challenge even your boss and sometimes say no, and that can be very, very difficult, but uh, I'm glad uh, overall, I think it's been a great, uh, and I wish everybody who joins this journey the same luck and uh, excitement that I had. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I, I often say we, we all want to make the biggest possible positive impact we can make on our organization and society. And this is a way to do it. As you said, sitting in the position you are in the organization you are, you 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 see a lot, you see everything, and you have an opportunity to really be involved in the most important decisions. So wonderful. This is a fascinating conversation. Thanks so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to share uh, some of what uh, your your year in program uh, is doing with uh, with all of our students, our alums, and our and our faculty. I, I thanks so much for the time, Lakshmi. Well, thank you, Sim, and everybody for inviting me for this. I really, it's a good opportunity also for me to take a break from my work and reflect a little bit on the journey. So thank you very much, for, and I enjoyed sharing this. So good to continue to be involved if we can. Thank you. Wonderful. Have a good rest of the day to you and yeah. to all of those joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye.